Well, first of all, thanks for the kind introduction and thanks to all of you for showing up this early in the morning. I know it's always a bit of a dare to give a talk right after the closing remarks, so I really appreciate you all coming here. Um, I'm going to present asset work on bug search in binary software, uh, which works cross architecture. And I'm going to wait for the first slide to show up before I actually start the talk. Okay, that works. Um, as said, I'm going to present my work. It's, of course, not my work all alone. Um, I've done it with uh, some colleagues of mine, namely uh, Berat Gamani, Robert Garlick, Christian Rosso, and my professor, Thorsten Holz. Unfortunately, Christian Rosso is not at the Ruhr University anymore. Uh, he uh, switched to CISPA in Saarland, which I forgot to mention on the slide, so I should really mention it here. Um, but all of them are actually in the audience, so if you happen to like this little piece of work, please make sure to tell them about it too. I'd really appreciate that. So, asset cross-architecture bug search. Um, if you ever feel a little bit lost in this talk, um, just remember that the key ingredient of it is a code similarity metric, uh, which happens to work across CPU architectures. So if you ask yourself, well, why are we doing all this pre-processing stuff? It's to set up this uh, key ingredient. They are slightly out of sync. We can probably get that fixed, right? OK, here we go. Key ingredient, code similarity metric. Um, as said, if you are asking yourself why are you doing all this pre-processing, it's, it's to set up this code similarity metric. If you don't know how we are looking for bugs again, it's with that code similarity metric. And the basic workflow all over what we're doing is you show us a binary in either x86 or MIPS or ARM, um, unobfuscated, that is. Um, you pinpoint us to the exact bug location, and then you give us another binary, and we try, we will try to refind uh, the same or very similar bug in that binary, um, which may be compiled for another architecture. So, and the basic assumption with uh, finding bugs with code similarity is that we know what a specific bug instance looks like. We try to find a piece of code which looks pretty similar to that. And, um, well, then it is likely to contain the same bug. And the reason for that is mainly because the reason for the code pieces being similar is that programmers are lazy. They will copy and paste code, and that means they will also copy and paste bugs. They may adapt them slightly to the situation, which is why we not only find uh, the same bugs, but actually sometimes similar bugs. So I'll start uh, with not our work, but actually with somebody else's work. Um, and that's for two reasons. First of all, because it really inspired what we did. Second of all, because I really like that overview graphic that they have, and that allows me to include it in my talk. So um, I'm talking about uh, generalized vulnerability extrapolation using abstract syntax trees. It's a work by Fabian Yamaguchi et al., who's also in, the, uh, in this room, as far as I know. And what they do is um, they analyze some source code, and the resulting abstract syntax tree abstract syntax tree is embedded into a vector space. And then they use uh, the metric of this vector space to find similar code vectors. And if one of them happens to, uh, happens to be known to be a bug, it's likely that the other ones may also be buggy. So um, what do we actually want to do? It's, um, so their work for me mostly means that they abstract from bug classes, which may sometimes be hard to use uh, in, in practice, actually. Um, so what they do instead is um, they and we focus on single bug instances. Um, second of all, we uh, want to focus on something like nearest neighbor search, actually. We don't do any fancy um, clustering or something like that, because what we actually just want to do is to find out if two pieces of code are similar to each other. Um, third, um, we want to do it not on source code, but on binary. Uh, and uh, all that we do actually has sub-function granularity because that is very important for bug search. If you think about it, if you know what a piece uh, of code that has a bug looks like, it would be really cool to find that not only in the function that it's in, but actually also in another function. And that requires sub-function granularity. And uh, last of all, we would like to focus more on the semantics and uh, the structure of the code than on any uh, symbolic or syntax information. So, and now it really starts with what we actually did. So we start off with an intermediate representation. 
As said, you give us an unobfuscated binary, be it x86 or ARM or MIPS. That's the architectures we support so far. And then we use uh, the VEX intermediate representation, um, most known for the uh, wall grind um, memory checking framework. And uh, that's IR is usually used for dynamic analysis, and we kind of misuse it for static analysis, which gives an own set of problems. Um, but we also had to modify it heavily to uh, abstract from some architecture-specific, let's call it idioms, so to say. And what we then do is we um, use basic blocks as our, let's say, single building block. And for each basic block, uh, we try to accumulate the effect this uh, basic block has on a specific register or memory um, location. So uh, we accumulate all the little uh, VEX IR instructions that um, have that specific regi register as target, and we got a, a big, big expression that uh, explains what happens to this uh, register or memory location in that basic block when you execute it. We pipe all that into Z3, and that is only to get a nice simple S expression out of it and to simplify it a little bit. So um, as you can see on the bottom, we start off uh, with some assembly code. In this case, uh, it's just something that reads off a memory location and increments a counter. And you can see that the uh, assembly instructions are kind of different. Uh, they differ in the number of registers in there. Actually, uh, x86 only has one instruction for doing both of those tasks. And the intermediate rep represent representation already looks kind of similar. So. Um, but these uh, complex uh, assignment formulas, as we call them, are kind of hard to compare uh, to each other. What you can usually do is uh, you can use some uh, unifying approach or something, which will tell you if they are equal or not. But that is really not what we want. We want some kind of scaling gradual similarity measurement. So what we did um, was we sampled, which means that we generate uh, a random input vector, execute the basic block, on that input vector, which gives us an output vector. So, and we do that for a lot of inputs. And that really gives us some kind of pointwise semantics of uh, this basic block. And now, um, the reason, uh, the reason um, why we do that is that similar basic blocks are kind of um, exposed to share in these input-output vectors, uh, these input-output pairs, and the more they share, the more similar they are. Now, from those assignment formulas, we have got a big, big set of um, I.O. pairs, basically. And that isn't optimal either, um, because to compare them, you have to do something like whatever, the Jacquard index or something like that, which is pretty, um, pretty costly, actually. Um, so we came up with another step, which is to use locally sensitive hashes. And those little things have a nice little property, uh, which means that uh, the similarity of the hashed object is actually represented by the hash, um, which is not similar uh, to cryptographic hashes, hashes for example. Um, and that allows us to save one hash per basic block instead of all the big, big list of input output pairs. So that in the end, we can compare two basic blocks, actually find out how similar they are just by comparing this one little hash. So, and now uh, that we've done that, we can actually go to uh, how to find a bug with that. We start off with a bug signature. Um, and in our case, a uh, bug signature, which is just a catchy label we needed, is just a piece of code. It is not as abstracted as, for example, um, in uh, network intrusion detection systems or something, where it's a glorified regex or something. It's just a piece of code. That's it. And a bug signature, in, in our sense, should um, contain the bug and a little bit of discriminatory context. Um, but as said, it's just a piece of code. It's not structurally different from uh, the target program we look for. Uh, we look in for the bug signature. So uh, the next step is to find some starting points. We start off with a single basic block um, in the signature uh, and try to find a good basic block level match in the target program, just to know where we have to like, start searching for a full signature spanning match. Um, and that, as said, gives us some starting points. And a starting point is somewhat of a misleading term because it's actually a pair of points, one in the signature and one in the target program. You can see that in the big, big picture at the bottom. As said, we start with the signature and the target program, uh, try to find some starting points. And the second uh, part of that picture is actually done on this slide. So now we do have these uh, starting points. And what we then do is some, what we call in the paper, bastard broadening. And it just means that we explore the neighborhood around uh, these two ma already matched blocks um, and broaden the match 
with the next best candidate we can find. So I'll try to explain it with uh, the picture at the bottom. On the left, you always see uh, the source program, the bug signature. On the right, you see the target program. And uh, a big black arrow represents that two basic blocks are already matched. Now, at first, only the starting point pair is matched. And what I should uh, mention next is that uh, the similarity in that picture is uh, represented by the number of edges. So the more similar the number of edges is, the more similar the basic blocks in that example should be. So as you can maybe see, there's two triangular blocks in the immediate neighborhood of the already um, matched block. And that is the next best match. So we fixed that one. And in the picture in the middle, we get that next big black arrow. Um, and we do uh, that incrementally until we have got a full signature spanning match in the target program. Um, this bested broadening is a greedy method, but it's locally optimal. So with all the, the neighboring uh, nodes we have, we actually look for a um, for a full matching that spans all of them and try to find the optimum of that at each uh, local point. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> so next we did some sanity checks. And what we did was we tried to match functions. Now a big, big, big disclaimer. Function matching is not our basic use case. Um, as said, we want some sub-function granularity. But for that, you have to come up with some sub-function uh, signatures. And we really don't have an automated way to do that. So the only way to convince you that it's not our clever choice of a signature that makes the match work is, well, just to use the whole function. So please keep that in mind. Function matching is not our full use case. We did not optimize for that. And um, actually, there would be some very simple improvements to uh, increase our um, function matching well, score, so to say. And as said, our framework supports x86 and MIPS and ARM, so it's quite natural that you can compare x86 code to x86 code, which would be um, comparing code for multiple architectures. But it actually turns out that we can do a little bit more. We can compare uh, code similarity from x86 to, let's say, MIPS. So we can do it cross CPU, uh, CPU architecture, and it still works pretty well. Um, it also works reasonably well for different compilers or different optimization levels. Um, and as you might imagine, the less similar the code gets, um, the more it is transformed, like by, let's say, switching the OS, switching the compiler, switching the optimization level, or switching the CPU architecture, um, the less similar it will be. So naturally, the quality decreases somewhat. But it doesn't decrease as much as you maybe will think, and it doesn't uh, decrease as much as to make the whole technique uh, pointless. Well, on the bottom, you can see a, a little bit of that um, cross-architecture matching, um, where we plotted um, the rank of the true positive in like the ranking um, we computed before with the um, summed up differences of the best match we had. We just sort them um, by the similarity, basically. And um, on the same architecture and even on cross-architecture, we can uh, achieve pretty good uh, matching rates at that point. Um, on the bottom right, you can, well, maybe not see, but retrace with what I'm going to say. Um, our uh, experiments regarding different compiler optimization levels. We took three compilers, um, compiled a piece of code with four different optimization levels. And the darker a pixel is, the better the match is. And um, you can probably see that um, for different compilers, the O0 optimization level looks pretty similar. Um, working on the same compiler works a bit, little bit better than switching it. GCC on GCC works still pretty reasonable and stuff like that, all in that one little picture. Now that we've done the sanity stuff, let's go back to bug finding. Not that that's not sane or anything, but so we go back to it. So these are just some examples. We have a few more uh, in the paper. But first of all, um, we took uh, the OpenSSL, the Heartbleed infamous one, and uh, tried to find it cross architecture. So you, um, let me remind you again, you show us the piece of buggy code in an x86 binary, and we are able to find it in an ARM binary or even in a MIPS router firmware. Um, as you can see on the bottom left, where um, we always searched uh, from ARM to another architecture or from MIPS to another architecture. Uh, x86 didn't fit on the slide. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, uh, there's actually two vulnerable functions, uh, two heartbeat vulnerable functions at least. There may be more other vulnerabilities in OpenSSL. And those are the cases for uh, TLS and DTLS. We use both, both of them as signatures, and so we also get like two, um, two matches. Um, to match rankings for the two vulnerable functions. And as you can see in the table, they are ranked pretty much perfectly, even across architectures. 
Um, we also like did uh, the same examples on BusyBox vulnerabilities and on the um, Circom backdoor, um, which we find in uh, closed source router firmware, which is pretty cool. Um, but the question that remains is, since all our algorithms do is give you a ranking, ranked uh, by similarity where the most similar matches are at the very top, um, even if you find a pretty good match, like the similarity uh, values are pretty far apart from the next best hit, um, is it actually a true positive? And the sad answer is, we can't tell. Um, because all we do is find some local similarity. Um, to find out if the piece of code is actually vulnerable, you have to do a lot more than that. You have to find out how to get to that position and how to fulfill all the necessary preconditions, the, the path conditions, to get to that point and to actually trigger that vulnerability. We can't do that at that point. Um, and let me give you uh, an, a nice example for that. Uh, it's patch code. A lot of patch code is actually just a piece of vulnerable code surrounded by a guard statement. And the guard statement basically says the path condition can never be met. But still, a localized code similarity metric uh, that finds this piece in the middle as being similar is perfectly fine, right? That's its purpose. Still, this bug can never be vulnerable, which is a little bit problematic. But um, as I said, for that special case of patch code, um, we tried to make a little improvement to that. Um, you can just, given that you already know that the code can be patched and that you know the patch, use two signatures. So um, you once try to find a match for the patched signature, um, and if the uh, function in question is more similar to the patched uh, bug signature than to the unpatched one, it's likely that it's also patched. If it's the other way around, well, you're in luck. Maybe you find a vulnerability. But that is something that is really up uh, for an expert to decide. It's just a hint um, in the right direction at this point. Here we go. So um, in summary, um, we work on binaries. No source code, all symbols required. Uh, we have a very fine-grained uh, sub-function granularity uh, code similarity metric. And by using that code similarity metric with a bug signature as input, we can actually use that for bug search. And maybe the coolest thing, which is why it's at the top, we can do so across architectures. So from x86 to MIPS, uh, from x86 or MIPS or ARM to any of the other um, architectures, that still works reasonably well. Um, so in the end, we come up with cross-architecture bug search in binary software. And that concludes my talk. And I'd be delighted to answer all your questions. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, Nick, we have time for a couple of questions. Doesn't have to be about this. I'll answer anything. <laughs> Hey, um, Alex Kentman, uh, Qualcomm. So it seems like um, sort of your work, you have to have a, a bug that you're looking for. So it's a targeted match. Have you looked at sort of more open-ended, basically bin diff kind of a thing? Here are two binaries you know, and different architectures show me similarities between them? Um, as said, function matching is not our thing, which is what bin diff uh, usually does. And we really try to focus on bugs we already know about, but which aren't fixed yet. So uh, we try to forget about all the new ones we don't know about yet. It would be cool to have those that we know about actually fixed. Um, our uh, bug extrapolation capabilities are unfortunately less good than what you can achieve in source code. So we are more likely to find actually this, um, the same bug in another situation than actually find a different bug, so to say. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, uh, this is Fish from Yoast SB, and I think your work is very interesting. And um, the thing that is, you can, you can um, compare functions across architectures are pretty promising. Uh, one thing I want to ask is that for ARM, especially for ARM, they have a lot of like conditional opera uh, conditional operations. Basically, means like a lot of instructions are conditional. Like they, they sometimes they are executed, sometimes they are not, based on context. And in our experiment, we see actually a lot of those. Um, but I mean, on ARM, you see you see many more basic blocks than other architectures because, because of those um, conditional, conditional operations. And how are you going to deal with that if you're comparing them like based on basic blocks? And another question is that, oh, I'm sorry. Another question is that uh, I think I read your paper, and then you talk about how to pick um, the range of the values for sampling. And it's from minus 1,000 to 1,000. Is there any special meanings of that? And if not, 
what's, what is a good way to pick the um, sampling ranges for, for values? Thank you. Okay, I'll start with the second question, which uh, concerns the range of the values we put into it. Mm -hmm. um, we experimented a little bit about it. We wanted to get like um, a pretty dense field, so we didn't want to have a lot of sparse values in it. Um, but apart from that, we simply chose a number and went with it. And as it worked reasonably well, we kept it. That's basically it. There's no special meaning to it. Um, uh, to the first answer, we actually found out that MIPS has by far the most basic blocks. Um, and that actually uh, x86 and ARM are more similar than x86 to MIPS or ARM to MIPS code. So if you ever ask yourself, is ARM is still a risk environment? Most likely not. Um, concerning the um, conditional uh, instructions on ARM, um, we can just sample. So uh, we can see a sampling value as an input to that binary condition. So um, if you just sample it a little bit, uh, that conditionality will reflect in the output values. I hope that answers your questions. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome. Hey, uh, I'm Jan from uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, from your paper, I gathered that part of your uh, accuracy drop, aside from compiler optimizations and so forth, is the cross-architecture part. Um, sure, yeah. And did you look into maybe grabbing samples of different source code, for example, compiling it for different architectures and doing an inner uh, architecture bug search. Uh, just just single um, architecture, but since you have... So I, I'll give you a partial answer and then ask you to rephrase what, what sure. came after that because... Um, so uh, in all our experiments, except the one for different optimization levels, we actually took code we found in the wild as it is. I don't know what compilers they used. Right. If they happen to use a similar one, all the better for us, but I really don't know. We haven't checked that. Um, that given... Please answer, uh, please uh, rephrase your question regarding the inner architecture thing. I didn't quite get that. So I guess if you look at uh, code in the wild and you look at MIPS router code, right, and you know some is vulnerable, and then mm -hmm. you look at other MIPS uh, routers to check against them, right, instead of looking for ARM routers. Because there's plenty of, you know, ARM code to check ARM code against. Okay, yeah. So I guess the question is, <coughs> do you feel that the cross-architecture part is needed? Um, or is so it, in, I mean, in theory, cool. what, let's say you have the source code, right? And you have it for usually compiled for x86, and you want to see if that specific bug in the source code is also in some uh, MIPS, router, whatever code, right? What you could do is just compile the source code to MIPS and then check MIPS against right. MIPS. But you don't always have the source code, do you? So that simply doesn't work. 